Greetings, Kindred. I am Voivode Maquette, and welcome back to My World of Darkness with episode 21 of the Thicker Than Water recap, where we are rounding off this with uh, the second half of Og Sanguine, which is a, uh, a module that was printed out by Renegade and, um, and made available. Awesome storyline. Um, if anybody has not run it, it is so fun. Um, it does the low fantasy stuff really, really well. Everything hits so close to home, and really I find that to be the spookier parts. Now just a little bit of an overview on where we left off. Uh, Dawn, Justin, Tinia, and Gabriel have all decided to meet at Gabriel's uh, chop shop. Sam ran off after he had himself, uh, well, he had himself a good time with the Anarchs beating him down in an alleyway, um, and by the time anybody figured out who he was, he decided it was time to run away, which Really can't blame him, considering how bad of a beatdown they gave him. And then also, I want to let everybody know that David is not here this week. Unfortunately, he had medical issues. He could not uh, he could not show up, but don't worry, he is fine. And uh, we will continue on the road with that. I've got a special little thing to explain why his character was not there. Um, but when he was basically trying to find everybody in the alleyway, uh, last game session is where I'm basically writing that he, they left before he was able to find them. So, um, with all that going on, as they're sitting in the office, uh, Duke gets a message from Isabella letting him know that she's received another text message from the group of supposed hunters who have been antagonizing her, who have been stalking her online, uh, letting her know that she needs to bring her master to a warehouse by midnight or all of the information they have is going to be leaked online, which could be devastating to her personal life, her career, everything. And who knows exactly how much they know. Uh, they could be releasing pertinent masquerade information and all that. Uh, so everybody does decide that they need to go to this place and figure out what's going on. Uh, they do get a hold of Sam. Uh, it's about 10 o'clock at night and Sam takes a little while getting there, but they, they do finally all get together. And when they give Sam the address, he sends Brittany off to double check the layout of the area. Now, while she does that, now I'm pointing out this is Brittany 2.0. Brittany 2.0 is the AI who uh, occupies a drone now most of the time. Uh, and she's able to dig this bit of information off of the computer records. And that is the warehouse used to be owned by a local shipping company, but the recent shipping crisis caused them to go out of business. So now they rent the space out for short time storage, as well as private functions. A private party paid cash to rent this space for a week. So they do know that it's a it's an independent uh, individual who's getting into the thing. Now there is so much information in this packet who these people are, how you can find them, all this all this amazing stuff that could be used. And I really kind of thought that Sam was gonna just jump in there and be the computer guru that Sam is. But he was just not feeling it this week. It's so weird. He decided to basically just do what you would think a typical Anarch would do, just rush in and, and do stuff without actually doing any preliminary work. Um, but. I guess that's just kind of how it went. So I guess that's kind of all that's needed. Um, now, so the party decides to hop into a van and get driving and they go straight to the warehouse. No looking, no anything else, no really calling for backup or anything. And uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's quite ridiculous. They just hop, hop into a van and they decide on how they're going to handle the thing. When they arrive at the warehouse, they are going to uh, have Duke driving and then he's gonna get out since he's the expected one to be there. And as he's walking over to the warehouse, he's going to leave the door to the van open, allowing the rest of the coterie to slip out in uh, Cloak the Gathering provided by Dawn, except for, uh, except for Gabriel, who's gonna go in his uh, bat form, because he has the ability to do that being Gangrel, and he's going to fly out and, and do a little scan also while Brittany is Brittany 2.0 is doing her thing. So they all arrive at this place, and I just, I want to keep this up here. I'll go ahead and I'll read what it says. It says, the industrial park seems eerily quiet as you pull up to the entrance. There's a tall iron fence with a barred gate at the front across a concrete road that rolls downhill to a variety of squat brick buildings. 
Each building has a large number painted on the side, each corresponding with a large laminated map hanging next to the gate. Alongside the road that leads to the complex, there's patches of brown dead grass, and from the grass sprouts tall lampposts, blazing yellow in the frigid night and barely illuminating the road. More lamps hang over the doors of the various buildings, although most are unlit. Mounted on each lamppost and on most of the building corners, you make out a CCTV camera. Each camera has a red light burning on it. You don't see a single person milling around, and no cars parked in the front of any of the buildings. It looks like everyone's gone home for the holidays. So we gave him that nice little description, and to, uh, and to do all this stuff, it was so funny, because Duke gets out of the car, I'm playing Duke, and as everybody's here, like, they, they stick to the plan so freaking well, but it's so funny because they had no idea what they were getting into with the plan. So Tinia and uh, Sam leap the fence using Soaring Leap. Uh, Tinia lands... Um, Trying not to make any noise and breaking her off you skate, she, uh, she ends up throwing an extra dexterity test to see if she can land quietly and not break it, which she succeeds in, while Sam, on the other hand, activates his weight of the feather protean and just kind of, like, drifts down. Gabriel is already off doing what Gabriel does. I think he's actually trying to figure out how to handle the cameras at this point in time. And then Duke is just sitting there with Justin and... Um, Justin and Don trying to figure out how exactly they're going to get through because they see an electric an electric fence that's gated and everything and everybody just kind of everybody's just kind of just just squawking at each other trying to figure out exactly what's going on but also trying not to make any noise so I went ahead with no good ideas coming up I went ahead and I threw the uh, the test that they give you here, which is intelligence technology difficulty of two, uh, where Duke was able to look online and fish up the, the visitor's passcode to get into this place. So he was able to get in without an issue, and uh, <laughs> luckily he actually had the dice pool to be able to do that. And uh, so Dawn and Justin just kind of walk in behind him. So all these things are just happening all at once, as they as they typically do. But um, as they're, they're getting through and, uh, and trying to figure out which building they're going to go, they do figure out through um, just general awareness that building 17, because I really didn't want them to spend the next three hours trying to figure out where the, you know, where the, the issue was going to be, I went ahead and I made it quite obvious that the only building that was here that was being utilized in any fashion was building 17. Um, basically by saying that the pallets that were stacked outside were a little off, like somebody had actually been messing with them, unlike the other ones, where if there were pallets outside, they were stacked very, very well. Uh, so they assumed 17. And as Gabriel's flying around trying to find a way in, we got the rest of this, this, gang of of anarch kindred who are just kind of like working their way through now justin is a camarilla he's being sent here by anaroma to try to get involved with what's going on because anaroma's child john is interested in isabella's uh, online content so it just it, it's so interesting to see everybody over here but as they're going and getting closer and closer to the place, um, this is, we actually had a little bit of a sad moment. Um, Sam has a famulus, a, a rat that he had found, and um, he sends the rat into the, uh, into the pallets to try to figure out what exactly is going on. But just as the rat gets in there, uh, Dawn starts messing around with the pallets. And, um, she is able to figure out what's going on and use Blink to get out of the way, but everybody else was not so lucky. Um, the pallets explode because there's landmines and everything underneath them, and it's just a fiery mess that goes everywhere. Um, 
Sam ends up taking a stain due to his loss of his Famulus, which I understand is not really in the book, but I really think it should be, especially if you have a character who bonds with the animal more than they would. I, I really do believe that with the emotional connection that certain characters are going to get, I don't, I don't think all of them should be subject to this, but I do think if, uh, if your character bonds with the animals more than it bonds with people around it that they should so he did he took a he took a stain he also took a couple ag with the explosion um justin was thrown clear tinia was thrown clear um justin took several ag uh and duke was uh going up the stairs towards the door to building 17 at the time and he was just thrown clear luckily sam uh because he really went flying. He took a lot of damage and went flying off of the air. Uh, he, again, way to the feather, he just kind of like glided back down. But with everything that was going on, uh, this ended up setting off, um, due to the blood being used to, to, to use Blink, Dawn ended up full-on frenzying at that place, hunger frenzy, because the blood was just getting so low. Because we had continued this game from the last game, and nobody's feeding. Like, they decided to not take the time to actually do any feeding scenes before they went and handled the warehouse issue. And um, so Sam lands close enough to Dawn for her to freak out on him. And uh, when she jumps on him, with everything that was going on, that ended up setting off a, a compulsion for dominance in Sam. And where Dawn isn't really physically strong enough to handle most things like this, just Sam was not having it this time, and he ended up breaking her jaw, and just, it was, it was a disgusting thing, because he decided that he was going to calm her down. This was not the first time that Dawn had frenzied due to underfeeding, and he just grabs her by the jaw, rips it open, dislocating it, jams his own wrist, and slams it down, and forces her to drink his blood until she calms down but this actually this really gets to her and while all this is happening Justin's like I'm out and he leaves that was it he's just like I'm he's I'm not here to get killed by a bunch of stupid anarchs who are doing stupid stuff and he left and he just left um, shortly after however with all this going on with Dawn she leaves too because she just finds herself on like completely she just finds herself completely incapable of handling any of the stuff that's going on, especially after that explosion. So, Sam's trying to find a way in. Um, Duke and Tinia at this point have gone into the building, uh, but when Duke got to the door, he didn't even check to see if it was unlocked or anything. He just used all of his potence to open it, ripping the door in half and tripping an alarm on the inside of the building. So the characters are now very uh time limited with everything that's going on because now the police are coming and uh as soon as they get in the, somebody's already starting to open fire and it's just it's one big cluster um with all the ruckus that's going on downstairs uh this gets one of the guys to come out onto the roof and it's a sniper there's actually a rooftop sniper uh character in this so that, the, that if there's any noise or if alarms get tripped or anything like that, he can come out and get them before they get inside. And uh, when he comes out, Gabriel takes the opportunity and just hovers right above him as a bat and then transforms back into his full human form, lands on him, and drains the guy dry. Now, I want to also point out that Gabriel's not exactly humane. We're running his character on Path of Night, uh, which is a... Um, it's, it's kind of like a, a sub-path from, um, from Path of Cathari. So he lands on him and drains him and then just throws him into the fire down below from where the explosion happened. And goes inside the building and ends up walking around the catwalks watching everything that's going on. Sam is still trying to find a way in because he doesn't want to go past the fire. He's not feeling too good about that stuff. So he gets around back and ends up looking through a window seeing what's going on and he ends up hooking a bomb up to the door that's never even going to come into play he just wants to make sure that if anybody tries to get out the back 
that they get stopped. But he ends up going higher up and looking out through one of the, the windows that's uh, like on the what would be the second story of this place if it wasn't just a big open warehouse. And um, when he looks in, he sees Gabriel going after another guy. And as he's going after the other guy and breaking an arm and slashing into him with feral claws, Sam's hungry. Sam is already low on blood. He's given blood to Dawn. He's been through a lot of stuff tonight so far. And he's strong enough with his boats to just open up the metal grating over the window, break the glass, jump in, and land on the dude and drain this guy. So it's just so nuts. We, we had a very amazing thing where the gunfire is just flying. Duke is basically drawing gunfire at this point. He's shooting at who's ever shooting from him, which it took a little while for them to realize that there was a guy up in an old crane that's uh, inside the, uh, like on the roof of this thing, and that there were two more guys inside. There was the guy that, at this point in time, Sam is using brutal feed on and just completely turning the guy inside out after he was already killed by Gabriel. And then there's another guy who's up in this elevated office who's shooting down at Tinia. And we've got some of the best uses of, of celerity being used. At one point in time, Tinia actually ends up using traversal and soaring leap, where she runs up the wall and then soaring leaps off, off of it, flipping over the guy, lands behind him, and grabs him by the throat. And this is when some of the best role play of the night happened. Because as everything's going on, as Tinia is sitting there holding the guy by the throat and screaming at him, why are you doing this? She eventually uses Daunt and forces him to tell her and uses intimidation to tell her. And the guy's crying at this point. He's wet his pants because she's used Daunt on him. And he starts confessing on why these guys are doing this, that they're friends of Moses, the guy who's up in the... Uh, there's a guy who's up in the crane who, at this point in time, Gabriel has already killed. Gabriel flew up there in bat form, landed right behind the guy, and just pushed him out of the crane after slicing him with his claws. It was an incredibly quick, easy done thing, but we we're dealing with these very powerful vampires. I could imagine how difficult this would be with base book characters. But these are characters who have already done things, who have already gained enough experience. And with that, it was really neat to see the difference when it came to this, but Tinny has got this guy, and he's, she's got everybody in the background screaming at her to kill him, just the echoing in her head, and she's like, the reason why this guy, these guys, are hunting down Duke is because they believe that he killed members of their family. And she realizes that there's nothing she can do here. There's absolutely nothing that she can do because whereas she does have sympathy for these people who want revenge if she lets them go they're just going to come back with with more force they're going to have more information because that right now right here it states in the book that these guys believe that duke is the only vampire and that anybody else who comes to help him until they show otherwise believe that they are servants of his that ghouls and uh, at this point in time, they know that there are vampires. So Tinia has to just kill him out of necessity at this point. And it really weighs high on her. And she ends up, she ends up taking some stains due to it, obviously. But um, so yeah, everybody's dead. They end up taking the bodies and throwing them into the into the fire outside and collecting whatever weapons they can and basically increasing Gabriel's uh, inventory, his arsenal. And uh, Sam ends up going over to building one where the security office is and instead of taking the time to like try to erase the tapes or anything, he just blows the place up. He just, he takes that bomb that he had put on the back door that never got used and he threw it into the, the building and just blew it up because the sirens were now audible. You could actually hear the signs, sirens in the distance. They could see the blue and red lights catching on the fog on the way over there. And they all hopped inside of, uh, inside of um, Gabriel's van. And I say all loosely on this one because we're talking about Tinia, Sam, Gabriel, and Duke. 
and they end up having to pull over and hiding in the woods in the van as the investigation is going on uh, for several hours and luckily they were able to get out before dawn uh, before the sun rose but uh, that was that was a terrifying event I ended up running a little bit more kind of individual scene by scene uh, just to, to mark things that had happened um, but just to catch everybody up on what was going on um, Justin ends up calling Pete the coroner who is now a newly embraced Hikata and his boss um, and asks if he could pick him up now Pete being the head coroner ends up just going to the scene with Justin in his car and checks out everything gets whatever information they can and leaves and on their way out they actually do end up seeing thanks to Pete's ability to see uh, things that are mystically hidden uh, he does end up seeing Dawn wandering down the road, and they end up picking her and her dislocated jaw um, up on the way out, and they end up taking her to the hospital to be able to feed off of coma patients, because Dawn's a Sandman, and it really does, it just makes things a lot easier for her to be able to do this. But the really fun part is, is by the time she actually feeds enough on the coma patients, to heal up she just leaves she doesn't even interact with anybody she's just done but at that point in time uh, Pete informs Justin of another incident that occurred that night and we will hop on to what's going on with that now uh, as everybody has pretty much done their thing and gone home while this was happening um, the news informs the rest of the players uh, what happened eventually but there was a tragedy that happened in southeast Fulton where at a dive bar a karaoke dive bar uh, 50 people died of asphyxiation and the news is pretty much just blaming it on the fact that there's old pipes and gas leaks and everything else basically the same stuff that they were using for the three-phase killer is being used again this time not to explain an explosion but to explain the fact that a large group of people passed away at this karaoke bar and there's no sign of actual injury that they all suffocated now Pete on the other hand ends up working this case and so does Justin and uh, he tells them that he, he tells Justin straight out he's like there's no sign of gas in the lungs there's no there's, there's nothing tainting the blood here. Some of them are missing some blood. And this looks like it might very well have been some sort of attack. And Pete is able to explain to Justin that it looks very much similar to powers that they can use, that the Hikata can use. It's oblivion. That it seems that what had killed these people was actually the air being just completely removed from them and that it seems more like a La Sombra than anything else and Axel was not there that night so we're gonna have to see what happens with that one but obviously when uh, when Pete and Justin go and check out the, the the scene it's quite clear that the Camarilla has already been there and cleaned up some of the more blatant evidence um, of what's going on so our next game session is going to involve what happened at this karaoke bar on New Year's Eve and how 50 people lost their lives. And I cannot wait to get to that because it's now getting back to my plot lines. And as much as I enjoy running this, uh, this amazing storyline that was presented by Renegade in the World of Darkness, I can't wait to get back to my own stuff. But, uh, yeah, if anybody's done All Sanguine and, and had a good time with it or didn't have a good time with it, let me know your experience if you ran. I know a few of you guys have. I've talked to a few, a few of you. But I'd really like to start a big conversation for this, for this video involving this plot line. So please share your experience. Let me know what your players thought, what you thought as a player or as a, uh, or as a storyteller and um, what kind of hooks you were able to find in the story that are going to add to fun things later. Um, I guess the last thing I should really say is when Tinia came home, she did find uh, a certain black and gray cat waiting for her, and um, 
It had a little note in its collar that said tomorrow. So that very next night on January 1st, she meets with uh, Billy Smith in his uh, restaurant at the Italian Friends of Amos Italian Eatery. And uh, they get to a conversation and Billy Smith just asks, are you okay? What happened? I had an agent there watching, but I didn't want to interrupt because you guys seem to be doing it very well. You handled that very well. And when she said that she appreciated the fact that uh, he didn't want to turn into a big political thing because it really did seem like an anarch issue, he looked at her and said, I don't want anything happening to my little sister. And I called post. And that was the end of game. Leaving Tinia still completely confused on how she's supposed to feel about this prince and uh, his method of handling things and the fact that she is his broodmate. So, I am Voivode Maquette. This has been a look into my world of darkness rather quick. It's only been a half an hour. And uh, I cannot wait to, um, to go into this more and see what the repercussions from this event has gonna be, uh, is going to be because I, I know that um i know there are going to be things that are going to come back from this so cannot wait to keep going and i will see you all next time good evening